It is a true pleasure to present the Public Council's 2018 William O. Douglas Award to Mike Farrell. Thank you. I uh, still hear a little voice saying you don't belong up here. When I was a kid, my grandmother said, don't get too big for your britches, Buster. I took it to heart. I probably stepped across a line somehow. There were a lot of lines, invisible lines. You found out where they were when you crossed them. Raised in a working-class Irish Catholic family is set up there. My brother and sisters and I had some things to figure out. Mom was a quiet, supportive presence, always there, cooking, humming, helping. Dad was huge. Uh, as I said up there, a big, two-fisted, hard-drinking guy. He was, a, he was gigantic, a powerful, handsome, very bright man. To me, a volcanic, terrifying figure, frustrated at being a working stiff. He was a tough, no-bullshit hero with a short temper, quick fists, and a wicked tongue. I say quick fists, I don't mean he was abusive, at least not to us. But many times he'd come racing in from the bar around the corner saying, if the cops come, I'm not home. <laughs> and head for the bedroom. We were deputized to cover for him, go live with that. I was his eldest son, a terrified, skinny, allergic punk with a snot rag in my pocket and no idea how to please him <clears throat> except to stay low, be nice, not cross any lines, and pray he'd someday decide I was okay. Kathy and Jim and Sally, our older sister, figured out their own way to deal with it. We were a family. We had to be there for each other. But in our family, no one said, I love you. There were no hugs, no touching, really. Our folks had seen tough times in the Depression, and they were pretty stoic. Things weren't shown except when Mom cried. Feelings weren't broadcast or demonstrated. They were understood, if you understood. I didn't understand. I grew up staying low, being nice, not crossing any lines, praying I could live up to Dad's expectations, but he died when I was 17, worked himself to death. I kept on trying to get his approval, figure things out, Graduated from high school, joined the Marines, came home, got a job, drove a truck, dreamed about having a life, maybe a career, met a girl, got married much too young, but thought I was doing what men are supposed to do. Marriage fell apart after three years, and I crashed. Bottom fell out for me. I, I didn't know who I was, what I was doing, who I was supposed to be, where I was going. I was a wreck, miserable, weeping wretch, lashing out, struggling, blaming, trying to figure out how I could have failed so badly. And a friend of mine, George, stepped up. <clears throat> George knew about a place he could help, he thought, uh, a halfway house. And he sent me there. He said they'd want, to make, want me to stand up and make a commitment, whatever that meant. I met there with two men, Ed and Ernie, Ernie had been a longtime junkie and thief in and out of jail. Ed was a psychological social worker. They ran this place along with Bill, a, a wonderful man, a shrink. They, Ed and Ernie, sat there and they asked me what I wanted. And I said, I want my wife back. I want my life. I want to be something. And they said, you know, people come here with a lot of problems, all different kinds, all terrible things. And we've found that underneath it all, they all want the same things, love, attention, and respect. What do you want? Well, I want my wife back, and I want my life, and I'm, I want to mean something. And they listened and looked at me calmly and said, well, we've found 
that no matter what appears to be the problem now, at base, everyone wants the same three things, love, attention, and respect. What do you want? <laughs> I want my marriage. <laughs> I want my wife. They were very calm, very patient. After I don't know how many times we went back and forth, I finally got it. Finally, when they said, so what do you want? I, I said, I, 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 I want to be loved and, and respected and have attention paid. And they said, can't hear you. I was a little confused, so I said it a little louder. I said, I want love and attention and, and respect. And they looked me dead in the eyes and said again, can't hear you. I remember George saying, stand up and make a commitment. So I jumped to my feet and I started screaming, I want love. And before I could finish the sentence, I was being held in the arms of two men as I sobbed my heart out like never in my life before that time. I believe it was the first time I'd ever been embraced by a man. And this was by two men. They calmed me and welcomed me into a year that became one of the most profound experiences of my life. Junkies, thieves, con men and women, alcoholics, people out of prison and mental institutions, men and women who sold their bodies, tough guys, hard men and women lived in this place. And all of them, and a few confused straight guys like me, were trying to figure life out. For most of them, the house, as we called it, was, was uh, an alternative to dying in the gutter. What we learned there was that everyone has value. All human beings want the same things in life, fundamentally, love, attention, and respect. And they deserve to have them. But many of these folks had never had anything resembling these things in their lives, and they were terrified. So they'd lied and faked and shot up and snorted and scammed and sold themselves. They'd hurt people. They'd contorted themselves into moral and emotional pretzels to get some cheap substitute for love and respect and attention that they were starving for but didn't know it. Now, there's not time to spell out for you the magic that happened at that place, but it was transformational. In my first session with people who knew their alternative to living was death in prison or the gutter, a guy said to me, who are you? He looked at me hard. I said, I said uh, I'm, I'm Mike. He said, what the fuck is a Mike? Trying to answer that question began my education. <laughs> These people taught me to figure it out, to look deep inside, to look past the fear and to find ground to stand on. We worked with each other, stripping off the masks, finding the core, teaching people who thought themselves worthless that they were in fact valuable. And no matter the unspeakable horrors of their past, there was nothing new under the sun. They mattered. And a new life was possible. One time, we worked with a very closed up guy, a repeat offender just out of jail, just didn't want to go back. And uh, this guy had buck teeth, uh, kind of lopsided, unpleasant face. He was a very tough guy, very hard case. And one of the women in a session spent a lot of time confronting him, trying to get him to open up. Finally, we saw some softening, some progress, and she pushed him about how many times he'd failed and said, if you could do anything you wanted to do in life, what would it be? After a long moment, tears started bubbling from his eyes, and he said, I'd like to work with the blind. Then we were all holding this ugly man as he cried like a baby. You know, sometimes it was so simple it broke your heart. We had a party at the house, and a visiting parole officer knocked out by what he saw, said to Ernie, you're doing great rehabilitation in this place. Ernie snapped back, rehabilitation bullshit. These people were never habilitated in the first place. <laughs> Over time, I became part of the what we called the responsible team that went into prisons to offer our program to those coming out instead of going back to the mean streets. I found prisons to be dehumanizing pits of hell animal farms where people are broken and rebroken, brutalized and diminished again and again. And I came away from a year at the house awake. Crooks and junkies and whores and cons and messed up people woke me. 
I owe them. Loving them, being loved by them, opened me. These folks who many dismiss as misfits or garbage or social detritus were my teachers. They taught me how to plant my feet, how to figure out where to plant my feet and beside whom. In a world where every human being wants the same things, love and attention and respect, they thought we should be able to work out a way to live with one another. In a world where all human beings have equal value, they said generosity and mutual respect should be the order of the day. But they'd come up in a world where the powerful abuse the powerless. In a country where, where what George Will called the tacky charisma of wealth seduces and poisons those who should know better and establishes a false hierarchy of human value. The people I knew at the house made me want to be involved in life, involved in the world. They made me want to learn and to be always on the side of the powerless. They made me look for teachers. They taught me to be one when I could. In the 60s and 70s, a revolutionary time, there were truth tellers, teachers everywhere. In the 70s, they showed us how to stop a war. But when David Mixner, one of the anti-war leaders, came out as gay, he was shunned by many longtime friends. He came to California to fight the Briggs Initiative that would have barred gay people from teaching in our public schools. David said to me that if a straight man would stand with him against homophobia, we'd win. I did. He was right. We won. So life happened. I had some very lucky breaks. You've seen some of that up there. I built a career, and with that career came opportunities, some of which meant a chance to meet hopeful people in places some consider shithole countries. <laughs> in Cambodia in 1980, after the Khmer Rouge slaughtered millions, the Vietnamese stepped in and the war began to wind down. Irish nurses there took me to refugees who'd thrown away their eyeglasses because wearing them labeled you as having been tainted by Western values and marked you for death. I met elders who were carefully recreating from memory foundational documents of their country's history and religion that had been destroyed by fanatics. In Central America, I met heroic young American volunteers who bound wounds and met the needs of Salvadorans driven from their homes by U.S. trained and armed soldiers who massacred peasant villagers deemed communists. In Nicaragua, we marched on the American embassy denouncing the CIA-sponsored Contras who raped and pillaged the countryside to undermine the Sandinista victory over Anastasio Somoza, the villain whom FDR said was a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. When I testified against uh, Reagan policy in D.C. In, uh, in Central America, the poor, wounded peasants I'd met were casually dismissed as the families and friends of the communists. In confronting that lie, I stood with Charlie Clements, a Vietnam vet who spent years in the mountains of El Salvador mending the wounds of guerrillas fighting the murderous Atlacatl Battalion. In the Gaza Strip with Ron Young, a Vietnam vet turned Quaker, I met with children whose bodies were pier pierced by rubber bullets and whose bones had been broken by the Israeli Defense Forces. In the Somalia chaos and famine before Poppy Bush sent in the Marines, I watched Two children in uniform struggle over an automatic rifle as their truck slowly moved down the street collecting the bodies of those who had starved to death the night before. In Rwanda, with machete-scarred survivors of that genocide, the genocide that claimed hundreds of thousands of Tutsi lives, a horror that could have been stopped if we'd supported General Dallaire's call for 5,000 UN troops, I stepped into a church so filled with human remains one had to stand on the pews to take in the carnage that the people trapped there had endured. Meanwhile, here, to our shame, racism, sexism, classism, religious bigotry, poverty, homelessness, and a growing strain of white supremacy thrive due to feckless, lying, so-called leaders. The land of the free and the home of the brave has become the home of zero tolerance, led by heartless bastards who'd rip children from the arms of their parents. cage those children and let them be abused while we shun, lock up, or lock out their poor, tired, huddled parents yearning to breathe free. 
Thank God for sanctuary workers, Me Too, Time's Up, Black Lives Matter, Colin Kaepernick, Mikey Weinstein, Emma Gonzalez, David Hogg, Salam al Mariati, Fred Nicholas, and the heroic staff at Public Council fighting. <laughs> fighting to bring this country back to its senses. I've been in too many of America's prisons where drugs and rape and crime, abuse and slavery and human immiseration flourish where solitary confinement is torture. I want to abolish prisons in this country, replace them with a cross between a school and a hospital where broken people can learn, be treated, and heal. And I'm disgusted that we are the only advanced Western nation that can maintains the barbaric ritual of state executions, killing <laughs> killing mostly minorities, the poor, the poorly defended, and the mentally ill, the innocent as well as the guilty, and horrific acts that, whether we understand it or not, brutalize us all. This tragedy is unmasked daily by the efforts of Sister Helen Prejean, the extraordinary Brian Stevenson, and countless other heroic abolitionists. And there, there is an answer to it all. It's you and me. Let me, let me close with a charge written years ago by a great man, my, my personal hero, Rabbi Leonard Bierman, who said, the most deeply human and courageous men and women are those who in life and death dare to submit themselves to the ordeal of walking through the fire of selfhood, of loneliness and tragedy. In their example, we can learn that this life, this world, for all its cynicism and stupidity and anguish, is also a place where change is possible, where one can take on a host of evils, even death itself. There is no guarantee of victory, but there is a choice. One either collaborates with the enemy, with whatever is miserable or inhumane, or one joins the resistance. To be most deeply human is to be among the resistors, to resist whatever demeans life. And that will lead us to become aware of what one human being owes to another, can mean to another, and to have compassion for all people, all of us, in our terrible fragility. I'm humbled by this honor. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>